Hello, welcome to Scary Thoughts, Horror, Philosophy, Culture. I'm Mark Kate, And I'm Chad Lott. Today we are going to be talking about Verotica, the Glenn Danzig film from 2019. But before we get started, write us, email us at whatthe at scarythoughts.org. And what else should we say? Spoilers ahead. I don't know what that means for this movie. Yeah, there's no real plot to spoil, so... Yeah. Should we even mention this? This is the day that um, the election was decided. So there has been periodic screaming in my neighborhood. Yeah. So sorry if the soundtrack to this podcast episode includes a lot of exuberant background noise. Yeah, it is the Mission District of San Francisco. And Officer Harris did lock up a lot of these people. So they're mad. They're angry. (laughs) (laughs) So... May I propose a, a way to start? Sure. What do we have positive to say about this movie? It is one of the most universally derided movies ever, but like what's, what works about it? I have nothing positive to say about this film. And Try you know, like I am kind of an optimist in this stuff and like I loved Boo, Medea, you know, like so I'm not above finding things to love in a mostly train wreck, but I don't find... Any, th- I mean, the girls' tits are awesome. Like throughout, like not all, like, uh, you know, not all of them are great, but there's a few. They're pretty interesting. Well, for going straight there, there is one very close up shot of a woman who has a lot of scarring, mm-hmm. and the frame is filled with her weird breast implant scarring, which is odd. Yeah, and not so sexy. Yeah, it, and it's not even like Cronenbergy. It's just like just that's how that went for her. Yeah. <laughs> The one thing I will say that I think is against a lot of common belief about this movie is there is a lot of terrible acting, no question. But actually, I think there is a lot of actually perfectly fine acting in this movie. Oh, who? I'm not good with names. And let me let me contextualize it. If you have a director that mm-hmm. gives you no direction mm-hmm. and you have no idea what's going on, and that director never says cut, so you're stuck on camera wondering what's going on and are we still rolling and what am I supposed to be doing? Mm -hmm. You can't blame the actors for that. And the thing about hiring porn stars is we have this sort of, I think, collective joke that porn stars aren't real actors, but some of them are. And the ones that are very successful are actors. That's part of their job Mm -hmm. is they commit to a role on screen and they might not have good dialogue And it might obviously just be all about fucking, but their job is to create a fantasy. And a porn actor's job is usually mostly predicated on their ability to sell that fantasy. And if they can't, they're not going to rise in the ranks so far, Hmm. no matter how big your implants are or how much time you spend at the gym. And so I think like Morella, who's the crypt keeper in this movie, Mm -hmm. her script was terrible And she was lit weird and she had weird things to do, but she was in it. She was totally there. There were a couple of other actors in this that I thought were actually good. It's just that they were saying the the weirdest shit. The police, (laughs) the the detective, I think. The detective, yeah. Yeah, going straight to him. I think what was interesting about him is, okay, everybody on this, in this film, except Danzig, I think is in on the joke. But they're still trying to do a good job. But I think that the guy who played the detective is in on the joke that everybody thinks they're in on the joke and they're not in on the right joke. I think he's just like, I know what this is. And he just went for it. Man, what an uncharacteristically generous read from Mark Kate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just saying that there are like actually maybe three actors in this movie that should not be given hatred. Did you invest they did in this the- film? <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking of the whole movie. I'm not talking about the lighting or the sets or the special. Oh, some of the practical effects were fine. What? Some. Which one? Were fine. Actually, this is something that Red Letter Media pointed out is the Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. When he's in the distance in the shadows, he's almost slightly interesting. But he gets all these close-ups where you're seeing the latex peeling up and the the swipe marks of his makeup and how it was applied mm-hmm. that totally blows it. So there's a lot of that sort of thing, too. Blown out crotch of the costume. Oh, my God. What it's the so fuck? good. It's so good. <laughs> but I think that that is a big part of what makes a bad movie a bad movie, is that even when someone is 
on set doing a good job, it is completely undermined and makes it look as if they're bad. You know what I mean? It's similar to this. You can be a good vocalist, mm -hmm. and if you get on stage and your monitors are way off and you can't hear the band or you can't hear yourself, you're going to be off pitch and you sound like a terrible singer. And it's not your fault. You're just doing the best you can and you can't be blamed for the engineer fucking you over. And I feel like there had to be some people <laughs> involved in this movie that were like doing their darndest trying to put on a good show and the collective incompetence that was going on dragged it all down. I don't know, man. I, I think like three people like doing their best in a bad situation is not a recommendation. No, it's not. <laughs> I, 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 hey, I, <laughs> and then like, I should also like up front say like the misfits is one of my all time favorite bands. I've probably listened to them. If there's any band I've listened to more, it might be the Wu-Tang Clan, but I, I've listened to a lot of that band. I love Danzig era misfits. So like I went into this hoping it would be great or at least like Rob Zombie level is kind of what I thought. But yeah. Glenn Danzig does not have it as a director. It, it is it is terrible. And I've seen these comics that they're based on. The comics are pretty terrible as well. Verotic without the A. So weird. But this movie is the worst movie I've ever seen. And I'm saying that as somebody who's seen a lot of like, you know, classically bad movies that are fun, bad or, or whatever. And I like to go see like silly independent films, you know, that that are like trying like or even YouTube horror. I've watched quite a bit of that. And I've seen better five thousand dollar films than this million dollar film. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's just so much wrong with this movie. Like people always compare it to The Room, but The Room is like. I, to me, more of a piece of outsider art than a bad film because Tommy Wiseau had the money to hire people who kind of kept it on the rails. And really, like, his acting isn't... It's not even just bad. It's just so singularly weird. And the people around him are, for the most part, like, kind of credible actors. And it's at least shot and edited in a way that isn't bizarre. Like, this movie is a failure. Like, I, I was watch. It's probably the first movie that I've ever watched that I thought, like, I could definitely do better than this. Yeah. Yeah. In speaking about bad movies, how much do you think the pleasure is a form of punching down? I mean, for some people, I'm sure it is. You know, when I watch like an old Ed Wood movie, to me, part of it is contextual. Like to have even made a movie at that time is insane. You yeah. know, like, like, so of course, like a movie like that, it was the best that could have been done at the time for somebody with those resources and that lack of talent and that was that it was even made was kind of amazing but now i would say it's not impossible to make a film like people you can make films now you could kickstart it especially if you have a name behind you like glenn danzig it would have been easy to raise the million dollars for this i think but all those other movies like have something like and some of them are original too like phantasm is kind of a bad movie but there's so much original in it like what, what to me one of the real failures of this movie like the third one, Elizabeth Bathory, it's just a pickup from something else. You know, the whole movie is basically like Black Sabbath. It's a format, like the trio of horror films. And, and, and within it, I guess a Spider-Man that comes out of tit tears is kind of original. I mean, it's yeah. original, but I don't know, man. I couldn't get past just how terrible this movie is. Yeah. I feel like I'm someone who is deeply invested in forms of bad cinema. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about it a little bit before in a previous episode where I'm invested in art and whether that means art that I think is succeeding or failing, I'm just interested in how the mechanics function. Mm -hmm. And so I watch a lot of movies where the end result is compromised or questionable because I'm often just as interested in questioning how did this fail as i am in looking at a quote great criterion film mm -hmm. and thinking about what made it work but i had two experiences that this really made me think of i saw a screening of miami connection with the filmmaker present which is sort of lauded as one of the great bad movies mm -hmm. and i also went and saw a screening of coven the yeah, movie yeah. that the documentary american movie was made about and the filmmaker and his buddy were there for that. And there were very different experiences. When I saw Coven, it was in this loft in San Francisco, and some people just set up a video projector. And 
Coven is a terrible movie, and mm-hmm. American Movie is a fascinating documentary about the struggles of independent cinema and the struggles of the filmmaker himself. But being in that movie with all of these hipsters that are into bad cinema, it really felt like they were laughing at the filmmaker mm-hmm. in a kind of cruel way. Yeah, it's it Tiger did, King shit. It was. It was a group of people who were there in a slightly predatory way. Mm-hmm. I didn't feel like there was a delight in independent cinema and rooting for the filmmaker despite the flaws of the film. But then seeing Miami Connection, which I saw at a sold-out presentation at the Alamo Draft House, the filmmaker was there, and he is off-the-rails bizarre. But I felt like the whole room was delighted Mm -hmm. he's obviously weird and that movie is fucking next level baffling but i felt like it was a room full of people who were like on his side despite how what he thinks he made and what it is don't align Mm -hmm. but there's i feel like a lot of gray and slipperiness in between the cruelty of the judgmental gaze at failing art versus taking delight in it it sort of reminds me of you know, it's like, when is it schadenfreude? Mm-hmm. Do you remember the Baby New Year from the Rankin Bass movie, Rudolph's Shiny New Year? Does that no, ring a bell? Yeah. You know those stop motion animated holiday films? They're not puppets, they're stop motion. Yeah, yeah. There was one with Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, but it's all about Baby New Year. And Baby New Year is always wearing this hat. And when his hat falls off, he has these giant ears that spring out and everybody laughs at him and he cries. It's almost like the plot of the movie is Baby New Year realizing that, oh, when your ears stick out and people laugh, at least they're delighted. And that's a good thing because you're making people laugh and smile and have a good time, Mm. even though it's at your expense. Anyway, that's the moral of that story. That's the Tommy Wiseau take. It kind of is. Yeah. Where the filmmaker is kind of in on the joke. Mm -hmm. But I feel like most of these filmmakers, whether it's Troll 2 or Birdemic, sometimes they kind of get the joke. But that doesn't mean, you know, Tommy Wiseau does go to the lobby sometimes and just like shake his head in despair that he thought he was making a masterpiece and he's just had to suck it up and and agree to the fact that this is the audience he's getting. Yeah, I mean, he's like really, in all the interviews I've seen, and I haven't seen too many, but like he always seems to be like, I've seen interviews ask him something like, does it bother you that people laugh at this film? Yep. And he'll specifically say, I'm delighted that people enjoy this film in any capacity. And I think it is, that is about as healthy a take yeah. as you could possibly have for this, you know? And it's interesting because it's like, you don't get the same with music. Like not, not, well, I guess you do sometimes like William Shatner's album is something that people like to like, that it, it was made earnestly that yeah. came out terribly and people love. But I think he came to have a sense of humor about. Yeah. But he, he also like, I, I think him and Tommy Wiseau both have some sort of like, inner joy at life that is palpable like i've been down in this like tyler perry rabbit hole lately like i i absolutely adore tyler perry and he's made i don't know like a thousand episodes of television shows like for real like he has like multiple shows in syndication and 11 films and they're not all hits you know and it's interesting when he talks about like how he processes something that didn't go the way he wanted it to. Like there's one movie that famously everybody's hair is all fucked up. Like their, their wigs are just terrible through the whole thing. And I guess I haven't seen this one, but it's so distracting that people just can't even get past it. And so he was like, well, you know, after that, uh, you know, he basically sent everybody back to cosmetology school or something like that. And so he, he learned from it and moved on. Right. The difference is like, you know, this is probably Glenn Danzig's first and last movie. If there is a just world, And Tommy Wiseau, to my knowledge, isn't making any more movies. So there's the singular effort is interesting. Like you get this one shot to make this bizarre thing. But then some people get to make a bunch of shit like John Waters. You know, like, so what explains that? Like that he is, John Waters made some objectively bad films, but the kitschiness of it and the, the camp of it kind of makes it into something else. Yeah, another example that complicates that one-and-done model is Andy Sedaris, who did um, most notably A Hard Ticket to Hawaii. He mm-hmm. That was his one of his middle films in his over. Like he, that yeah. was film number four of nine, and he just kept making these garishly terrible movies that mostly were excuses to have women topless in hot tubs, and they're mesmerizing, but he just had momentum and funding or something. Well, those movies 
to me, like, work better than Veronica. You can watch the Hard Ticket to Hawaii, and there's just something fun about it. It and is. This is something else I was thinking about. Was like, are artifacts from periods of your life more passable? Right. In some ways. But that doesn't explain Veronica because, like, the whole idea of playmate looking girls and horror like that's the shit i grew up with like right. i should be hard coded to love this movie and and excuse it for the same reasons that like uh like a drag fan might excuse the mistakes of an early john waters film like right. you would look at it and see like there is something here but like for this movie there is no there there well and, it's interesting when you brought up tyler perry and joy Mm -hmm. is I don't know Glenn Danzig personally, and I try to be hesitant to take people's public persona as fact and try to glean too much about their work from that. Mm -hmm. But I don't feel any... <sighs> he is making a tribute to exploitation and B-movies with so much self-seriousness that it seems yeah. to undermine what he's doing, which is very baffling. Yeah, it's like the people who take Satanism really seriously or the people who are really fun and wear like Satan lingerie because it's a goof. Yeah. Like the latter is fun. The former is just well, it's the Church of Satan versus the Temple of Satan. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I mean, but even like Anton LaVey, there was a wink. You know what I mean? Because he's yeah. a carny. No, true. Like true. There, there's something about it. I think it's like, it's like Glenn Danzig's like the real deal. It, it's like a real self-serious, tedious person who almost all of his fans have a better handle on the shit that he's into than he does. But he's, I mean, the other thing is he's been famous for the shit for 40 years. You know, I think that might be another thing is like a Tyler Perry comes out of nowhere. Uh, a, a, an Ed Wood comes out of nowhere. Even John Waters, like these are people who were part of these weird little scenes and then just made a movie cause they could like Kevin Smith, another yeah. example. Yeah. You know, they just like grabbed onto the, the rail and just held on. Whereas, like he could have done this at any time and you'd think like you're you're coming to it with all these resources and that is this defined aesthetic how come it worked for rob zombie and not for danzig and i think i mean one answer is just rob zombie's more talented sure but the other is like does he have no friends you know what i mean like nobody went dude that spider costume looks like dick like not one friend my suspicion this is big assumptions but my suspicion about a lot of the questions that we can have about this film can be answered by that he was drawing from B-movies and exploitation cinema and low-budget filmmaking, and by doing tribute to them, I think he made a lot of decisions that were sort of, uh, he was excusing himself mm -hmm. from a lot of the finishing touches. You know, and you can do that. Like, I often talk about, well, what excuses are built into the artwork that the framing of a work kind of lets you overlook certain things. Mm -hmm. The energy of an early punk song will let you overlook certain skills, music, right. musical talent in a traditional sense, for example. I think that he might have been, because he was inspired by B-movies, he was trying to make a B-movie, but by doing so, he actually left in shit that, like, doesn't fly. A lot of the shitty things about this movie aren't charming or interesting or add to the depth of atmosphere. They're just incompetent by someone who should not be making incompetent decisions on a film yeah. set. All the problems with this film, like, if I was describing this film to somebody, it would be funnier than it is. Right. You know, and like we were talking about like somebody could take this raw footage and turn it into something kind of awesome. Like imagine just instead of having this ultra crisp, like harsh lit thing, you just run one of those VHS filters over it. That immediately like, you know, you're just basically turning it into like a nostalgia piece, but it's sort of like. It would have helped. It would have helped, you know, and then, you know, the holding on very long at the end, <sighs> the office does it. Yeah, and right. it's funny there. So how come it's like but not those, funny? But those actors are improv com or probably have improv comedy mm -hmm. in their in their basket and know it's coming. Right. So, like I doubt an office take where they nobody yells cut. Those actors know that that's what the deal, mm -hmm. and it's, they're there to continue that comedic moment, as opposed to a bunch of actors who are not seasoned in that kind of thing, just going like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what my character is. 
when is he going to yell cut? What's going on? Yeah. How, what am I supposed to do now? Do I walk off set? Yeah. But the, I mean, the other thing is, it's not like there aren't funny porn stars out there. You know, like the, I can't not remember her name, but there's a girl that is, um, she's in a couple of Kevin Smith's movies. She's very funny. Like, so it's, it's like, it's almost like he chose, like everybody in the movie feels humorless too. Um, yes. And I have to imagine, like, I wonder if the set was really stressful. Like, I wonder mm. what it was like to shoot, you know, cause mostly I think in Hollywood you have your budget and you hire professionals and it's people take it seriously cause it's their job. Yeah. So I don't think there's like. I read some article that was questioning whether or not the crew had sabotaged it. I don't think that's the case. Like you just want to mm. work, you know, it's, it's like, it, like there would be like nights where promoters I didn't like at the bar would come. I wasn't sabotaging them. I would just do my job and just yeah. sneer at them, you know, like, I'd, well, I almost feel like if you saw, let's say 20 film stills from Veronica and mm-hmm. we're told a story about like, yeah, Glenn Danzig made this movie and it's really, really bad, but apparently it was just a party on set every night and everybody had a great time. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like this is a document of the party. You'd go like, oh, that's cool. But if you watch this movie, this seems so joyless. Yeah. Uh, another terrible movie that is fun to watch, Range 15, like the Black Rifle Coffee Club guys. Like Explain the, the, that. Okay. So there's this company called Black Rifle Coffee Club. And what they are is it's a veteran owned coffee company. And it's good coffee, but their whole shtick is they do a lot of funny YouTube content. So it's like for veterans. So it's very dark, non-PC, like pro-Second Amendment humor. You know, they're basically like gun prop comics. Um, (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Like it'll be like, you know, who needs a 50 cal? I do. And it's like they shoot their friend's car because it's funny. It's like borderline. Because it's funny. (laughs) It's like, it's basically like patriotic jackass kind of. But they have good comic timing. So they're funny guys. And they made a movie called Range 15, which is like, what would a zombie apocalypse look like if there was a bunch of veteran drinking buddies instead of just a bunch of randoms? And so then like everybody's in this movie, like William Shatner's in it, Ted Kennedy's in it, uh, Sean Astin from Lord of the Rings and Goonies. And it was like Kickstarter funded. And it's not a great movie. I couldn't couldn't get through it, but I kind of respected what they were. You can tell everyone's having fun. Right. Like it it was obviously fun to make that movie in a like waiting for Guffman kind of way. Just there's so many like technical flaws in this movie, like just mistakes that could have been funny. You know, like, like, you know, a good example is the, um, the fan with the light through it, creating the effect for the the porn house theater. The projector. Yeah, the projector. They have the fan in the shot. Yeah, it's just very weird. It's and so then weird. the red letter of media guys pointed out, like I watched this on my phone, so I didn't see it, but you can clearly see the crew on the side in yes. some shots. And then there are movies where that happens and it's funny. Like I think Well, there's like, a Starbucks cup in yeah, the Yeah, the Yeah, like, no, like it happens. It fucking like there's a lot of shit going on. Yeah. But how many of those mistakes do you get? <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, transmitter microphone transmitter packs. Oh yeah. In you see movie the packs, in frame. Yeah. Uh, the, the other strange decisions, like why set the first vignette in France? Like it does nothing for the story. Nailing a French accent consistently is very hard, even for people who train in it. I took French for years and I can't do it. And I have a good French accent because my family is French. And even it's probably shitty. Like I couldn't do it on camera very well. Mm -hmm. So to take a bunch of jabronis. Yeah. And expect them to, they're in France. So they speak in a French accent. It makes no bloody sense. Yeah. Like we call him le neck breaker. (laughs) What is French for neck breaker? Like why not go all the way? You know, like it doesn't. (laughs) Oh God. I mean, I guess. If there is a joy to this movie, it's sitting around going, what about, why that? Why this? You know, just things like the woman is on the couch when her eye boobs cry, yet the tear falls on the spider that's across the room. 10 feet away. It's just just weird, man. How invested are you in like Mystery Science Theater 3000 and how did this get made and Red Letter Media and all that? You know, I've watched Red Letter Media. Like the thing that put them on the map was their like two and a half hour breakdown of why The Phantom Menace sucks. Uh, Wasn't it like four hours? I thought it was was like twice the length of The Phantom Menace. I remember it being very long, but it was one of the first like really well done high concept like breakdowns of, of a movie that people hated. And so obviously I think they're pretty quality, pretty high quality. Although I guess they've 
taken some fire in the last few years. I don't follow it at all. Oh, um, fire, I watch fire mis- for what if? I, I don't know. I think people just find their opinions like, you know how some people have a, a strong opinion about like Chapo trap house humor? Yeah. It's like that. There's oh. people who that is just simply not for them, but the size of it makes it unignorable. Like instead Got of it. just not watching it, they have to be like, it exists and I'm enraged by it. Like there's, oh, there's, okay, there's okay. sort yeah. of that sort of Whatever. thing. Whatever, yeah. And then MST3K, I mean, it was funny. I watched it when I was a kid. I could give a fuck about it now. Yeah. Um, I, I just don't... I don't know that I really care to watch something that's bad on purpose. And I don't need that experience elevated by like a snarky comedian. Right. Like I I just don't, I would much rather watch something fucking great than something that was funny, bad. Right. Which is very, uh, antithetical to you having a degree in rhetoric from UC Berkeley, which in my mind is very invested in deconstruction and strategies of horizontalizing all creative endeavors where there is no high low and everything is worthy of dissection. No. Well, no, that's definitely the agenda of that. You know, it's a postmodern outfit. You know, it it really, like when people talk about postmodernism, like people even say like postmodern Marxism isn't a thing. I understand why they're diametrically opposed but at my department, Marxists were teaching postmodernism. So there is a little bit of... <laughs> so there it is. There's a bit of a mixture. It, it exists in a certain way. Is it undermining our democracy? Probably not. I mean, it, it, I think it's probably just... It's, it's just undermining those people's ability to get a job once they graduate. And I think probably the danger of that sort of thing is you get out into the world and it you sort of stop believing in hierarchies. And I'm here to tell you, man... Some stuff is better than other stuff. Some people are better than other people. Like there are natural hierarchies. Like I would much rather have a 70s Ducati Cafe racer than a late 2000s Honda Rebel. You know, like it, like there's just some stuff is just fucking better. And I get that like your resources and your environment might limit you to what is better. But just because you're stuck with something shitty doesn't mean it's great. Like it's time to fucking improve. And so for some people, that's kind of like a, I guess some people just don't dig that and you you can, but I'm not going to turn my blind eye to being able to make a judgment, uh, especially because I believe in like caring about stuff that is good and not elevating stuff that is bad. Yeah. Yeah. I think I come at it very differently. I mean, I, I am deeply invested in how did this get made? The podcast mm-hmm. I've listened to every episode, a minimum of twice, that seen them live several of, times. That stuff is kind of more interesting to me because as a person who works in like kind of a creative field like marketing is basically creative and through the show and you have met all these artists you see genius things not get made and terrible things actually get made and to me i'm just interested in that process like why did that actually happen there's like historic not majorly historical but there's historical things at play like glenn greenwald was gonna make a movie about uh tennis player i can't remember her name the one that's in trouble for being a turf now maria navatilova i don't she's she was Didn't a hear about that yeah she was like one of the only out players yeah. and so you know there's the whole question of her like you know protecting women's sports where i don't really have any opinions about this but like all of a sudden that person is out you realize like okay there was going to be this glenn greenwald documentary about a tennis player who inspired him and then like a twitter dust up makes it not happen and like uh, taking out whether or not the Twitter dust, dust up was valid. It's just an event that happened in the world that prevented this thing getting made. Whereas cocaine must have been responsible for erotica or something. Although I don't think Danzig is a partier from what I understand. Don't know. Yeah. Don't know. I mean, it, it definitely having like porn stars in your movie definitely mm-hmm. gives it the veneer of party. Does it though? But by signifiers. I mean, I read a lot of articles about this movie that, We're talking about, well, it's his rock and roll lifestyle as if it's this trademarked thing that we can all agree we understand what it is. Mm -hmm. And I think that hanging out with a bunch of strippers signifies that sort of thing. Yeah. But whatever. To me, like that doesn't stand up to being in a world where the wrestler's monologue about Kurt Cobain, the movie The Wrestler, when he was like, he's like, and then grunge came and fucking destroyed all this. Like we are not, that is not the world of rock and roll. Like that's a weird eighties right. rock and roll world, which as a punk, Glenn Zanzig was sort of like 
I guess supposed to be opposed. Uh, no, that's not true. They've yeah, had malicious goth girls the whole time. It's yeah, a, yeah, kind yeah. of a different thing. Yeah. So in this realm of like movies that would be covered by how did this get made? And we're talking about movies like the room and mm -hmm. Miami connection and all that bad movies, whether we're talking about Ed Wood mm -hmm. or toxic Avenger, or th there seems to be this very diverse range of what we're talking about when we say trash cinema or B movies or whatever. And I feel like it's not very well sub genre defined mm -hmm. where I feel like these movies that are in the highest canon of the last 30 to 40 years, like Troll 2, Birdemic, The Room. Like, what do we call... It's almost like using the parlance that's going on now, we could call it like elevated trash, you know, where it's like so good that it's engaging. You don't need Mystery Science Theater 3000 to be shitting on it actively to make it interesting, mm -hmm. like a lot of those bad movies that actually it is engaging on its own terms, but for very weird reasons that aren't like watching John Wick is engaging. It's engaging because your jaws on the floor trying to understand the decision-making process from moment to moment. Yeah, I don't I feel know. like we need a new taxonomy <laughs> of low-grade cinema. I mean, it used to just be called a midnight movie, right? Like a yeah. movie that was so strange that y you would go out of your way on a midnight yeah. on Saturday night to go see it. And then there was like a bit of a pleasure in being part of like a scene of people that would show up and see it. And cause that's the other thing. I remember the movie theater that played the Rocky horror picture show in new Orleans would sometimes have other midnight movies yeah. and you would go see the legend of the over fiend or something, something weird or like, you know, Akira. There was a time when it was kind of hard to find like anime stuff in rental. And you would be with a group of people and it was sort of an event that seems fun. You're going to go out to experience something together and then process it together. But to sit down by yourself and watch any of these movies, I just don't get, I do it all the time. Yeah, man. I just, maybe, maybe a third to a quarter of my, my movie watching is something that is by no metric ever going to be a criterion collection movie man i i whenever i sit down to watch something like that like the, probably the one exception or like action movies like i'll watch an action movie that but i only want to see like pretty credible action like I, yeah. i'm a fan of like action choreography like i don't want to watch some shitty delta force movie well what's interesting about some action movies is that you're often using the bad movie is an excuse to see some martial arts mm -hmm. that are practiced by people who have dedicated their lives to being fucking amazing at something. Yeah. And the movie is just an excuse as opposed to if you took away that really amazing martial arts practice, Yeah, you're left with very, very little, you know, like at least there's something there yeah. that is actually genuinely amazing. Yeah. It's something in the way that like, like pro wrestling is athletic, you know, like that. And yeah, yeah. I, I think when you, when you talk to anybody who's like a real fan of pro, like, like even as a person who's like kind of an ironic fan of it or a person who just loves it, there's an admiration for the athleticism involved. And I will tolerate like a bad action movie more than I'll tolerate a bad horror movie. Huh. Um, and usually it's like you said, cause like, I want to see like Benny the jet, like jump kick somebody in a weird seventies movie or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar fight Bruce Lee. Like there's something cool about that to me. Cause I like athletics, but I don't know. I mean, I guess Veronica has pole dancing yeah. as an athletic. I think that, well, although a weird thing is that even though this movie is reputed to be all like strippers and, mm -hmm. and porn actors, there are a couple of really good pole dancers in this movie. Mm -hmm strippers but the main two that we have the most screen time with can't actually dance like the um mystery girl mm -hmm. she just slowly waves her hands in the air she doesn't do anything no she has like i think three strip scenes where she just slowly moves her arms in the air <laughs> why why is she the stripper like it's like he hired her specifically because she wasn't good as at as a stripper mm -hmm. it was very weird yeah, but uh, just backing up a second, I think there's also a subcategory of these films that, like, especially in horror, it seems to me that the majority of horror movies are these willfully, intentionally trashy, like, vixen bloodbath, mm -hmm. or, you know, something that you can tell from the title that is 
third generation irony, intentionally bad special effects, willfully mediocre acting, and I want no part in it. Like, I don't understand the inclination to make those kinds of movies. I don't exactly know what we call them, but you know what I mean, right? Yeah, those are more like uh, like midnight movie homages, I think. Like, um, like God, the, the guy that makes Hatchet. I can't remember his name. Right. Yeah, like that would be a good example. And that guy, if you've ever listened to his podcast, he is crazy knowledge about, knowledgeable about horror. Like he's a guy who like, I think if you were hired him and said, here's a red camera and like $10 million, we want you to make something that looks like a Hitchcock movie. He could probably pull it off. Like right. he could probably make it, but he chooses to make like bad slasher movies. But that is even something different than this. You know, like, oh, yeah, exactly. Like, I think he couldn't make something like this. That's like being in an, in an oi band to me, like, like to, yes. to today be like, yo, let's just start an oi band. Like, Fully. Yeah. I, okay. I might cut this out. <laughs> but this reminds me of how we started using the word special. So there are a lot of words that we can use for people with learning disabilities, etc. Mm -hmm. But we've sort of at least currently settled on the word special. It's very affirming. Mm -hmm. And it is used to elevate or signify people with a certain kind of cognitive struggle. Mm -hmm. And I feel like these movies... Talking like about Democrats? Whoa. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm, kidding. <laughs> I'm cutting that out no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> um, but these movies like Birdemic Control 2, mm. they're almost like special. They're very noteworthy for the way they're struggling against mm. trying to be a regular movie. And obviously this wasn't trying to be a regular movie. Troll 2 is not trying to be a regular movie. But in a sense, they are. This like, They, they are not getting... accomplishing being what they are. They don't know what they are. Yeah. So they're not attaining at, it. Totally, I think, is definitely accurate. Like, even like a more modern term, like neurodivergent, mm -hmm. might even be like, like Tommy Wiseau, for example, yeah. I think is like, there's just something interesting about him. There was a kid that we went to high school with. It was, you know, special needs or whatever. And he would go around collecting can tabs off the ground. I mean, he was just a, a just a kid, you know, had some mental struggles, but everyone fucking loved him because he was just so interesting and we would do dances and stuff. So he was like, it, it was interesting to see in high school, in an all boys Catholic school, a fucking Lord of the Flies environment that this kid was pretty much like revered by the football players. So it was, it was like, first she'll be last, last she'll be first kind of thing, you know? And it, like, <laughs> yeah. and maybe it explains the popularity of things like Forrest Gump or, you know, it, like it's more of a parody, but like Simple Jack and Tropic Thunder. Like there's like a carve out space for enjoyment of that sort of thing. Yeah. Is that what's happened with film? I, the films in general? I don't know. But I mean, there's definitely something cool about like Phantasm is a good example, mm -hmm. you know? I think there's another angle that we can come at it, which is to think about outsider art. Yeah. Which is not the best term for what outsider art is usually trying to say, but the way in which these movies are trying to do something and fail at, in some way, at the very foundational thing that they're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that outsider art is that. I would say outsider art is often that it's often art that the world really has to struggle to find the terms under which it's made. So if you look at Adolf Wolf Lee or um, Harvey Darger, their art, it's not that they're failing at anything. It's that for you to understand it on its terms is really hard. Mm. It's, har it's harder for you and I to access Harvey Darger on its terms than it is for you and I to watch Minority Report and really know what the fuck's going on at, at core. There's nothing yeah. confusing about engaging with Minority Report or A Room with a View or something. Whereas yeah. coming to Adolf Wolfley, it's like, wow what the fuck is actually going on here? You, you have know, to create new rules. I mean, yeah, totally. I, I, I'm like a huge fan of outsider art, especially like Southern outsider art. Like I worked at House of Blues in New Orleans for like two months or something like that. And one of the coolest things about working there is they take you on a tour of the whole thing. And so there's what you see as a customer, but all within it and the back end of it and all the offices and the blow areas, it's full of outsider artwork that like the owner of the place bought. 
and I can look at that stuff and it's as compelling to look at as a Rothko or a Jackson Pollock or something like that. And then when you learn that the person is like born with half a brain and like was a sharecropper, like that shit, it's very interesting to me. But I look at that stuff and it has, there's a non-typical pleasure to looking at it. Mm -hmm. it. It succeeds in its own way, like like the way Daniel Johnston does. Like yep. I love Daniel Johnston's music. For sure. Actually, I mean, that... That piece of artwork right there is from Creativity Explored. Oh, I which love is a everything in there. Mission District, like local artist. I always forget his name. He's pretty prolific, but he does these really interesting characters that are super bizarre and compelling. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. There's a scene in Ab Fab where the two main characters uh, are asking, What is the difference between a painting by a child and a childlike painting? And it's a, a goofy joke, like, but. I think part of the plot is that like a child's painting has sold as like an outsider art for like millions of dollars or something like that. But I've never really heard anybody really articulate like that difference, you know, and then that, I think that's the point at which the difference between something like female trouble and Veronica, like they're just, I mean, for sure. Yeah. Well, they both had the same restrictions, but it's just something different. I think that it's something about where outsider art breaks with what we're talking about is that because movies take so much capital mm -hmm. and so much collaboration and dispersed labor it's not the same as a solo musician recording themselves at home and sharing that product it's not like a painter yeah. an obsessive compulsive painter coming up with really interesting stuff on their own terms they need to be able to communicate that to other people or they need capital yeah. to make it happen. And so that's one of the barriers in cinema, I think, is why something like The Room and Birdemic are so unique is because there's an outsider artness to it happening. There's a lost in translation happening, but there has to be so much money and so much communal activity to make it happen that it mm. makes it even less common. And makes it yeah. more, so much more anomalous that it is special. It's really special that mm -hmm. like, well, the name of the podcast is how did this get made? It really does make you go like, what the fuck? When you see Adolf Wolfley, you can marvel at that person and be fascinated by the world that he created for himself in his art. But it's not as confounding as looking at something like Verotica and going, what the fuck? So this is one of the reasons why I think The Room is better than Verotica. And you could say it's objectively better is he paid for everything himself and it's his vision right. and like so the room to me really is a piece of outsider art whereas the verotica is a cynical failure right you know i think maybe the difference too is like okay danzig like i said he's 40 years famous i'm sure there was people lining up to hand him money probably a bunch of fucking warp tour millionaires were like bro i totally got you like here's 10 grand like i, I would not be surprised if that's how this movie was made but it's sort of like leapfrogs the type of filmmaking where it's like you and your buddies in a quick stop and you got to figure out how to make it look like you're playing hockey on a roof, like in clerks. Yeah. Like you don't have like a union grip guy that you've hired because you're already in Hollywood and you're burning up other people's money. Like you don't have that guy like setting these parameters or you just have your buddy in a shopping cart on fire being pushed or whatever, you know, like whatever zany shit you would do is like a, a filmmaker. It's like, there's like a middle spot that this movie is at is that you need more money or less money to do something cool. Kevin Smith talks about that with mall rats. Like one of the reasons why mall rats is terrible is they got a little bit too much money to do it at the time. And then they, instead of being creative, they ended up relying on like, well, this is the way it's always been done. And like, you could imagine on Danzig's set and somebody just lit the shit and was like, this looks great. And he maybe not being an expert. And that was like, okay, I assume it looks good. Yeah. I mean, this is something that my investment in horror cinema relies upon a lot is that I feel that because horror movies, I wouldn't say guarantee you a profit, but it's a pretty profitable endeavor mm -hmm. and don't usually cost that much money Yeah, that there is a freedom there. There is a freedom to experiment and there's a freedom to take chances that aren't necessarily going to be there if you have $200 million. Like mm -hmm. we are all blown away by the spectacle of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But there are no genuine surprises. There's nothing awe-inspiring about those movies other than 
some technological feat that will look tired and be able to be accomplished on an iPad in two mm-hmm. years. And so what you're left with is a lack of risk taking and a lack of experimentation. A lot of people making very safe choices mm-hmm. with a lot of money at their disposal. And it's almost as if the entirety of the Marvel Cinematic Universe is not nearly as daring as Vast of Night, as Texas Chainsaw Massacre, mm. as almost any horror movie we've covered on this podcast. Yeah, I, I think as far as like, I, I don't think, with the possible exception of Thor Ragnarok, there's not an original moment in any of the Marvel films. Like, not a moment that you couldn't say, like, well, I've never seen that before. Right. Like, it, it just... Or I've never thought of that I've before. never thought of that. And, you know, and but it's also playing a different game. It's like, can it bring the wonder of comic books to life and break a billion dollars every time? Like, it's a totally different set of rules. Sure. You know, and then a lot of the, like, a lot of the directors of those films came up through horror and funny things. Yep. You know, like, I mean, Taika Waititi, yep. you know, he, I'm mean, not straight horror, but, you know, he's, he made what we do in the shadows. Like, so good. Like, so, <laughs> you know, I'm trying to remember who else might have been a horror director that, I mean, or uh, another good example is the guy who runs the whole thing. Uh, John Farrow makes Swingers, which is like a heart movie, you know, and it, it's the type of, like when Robert uh, Rodriguez, another like small time filmmaker turned huge, when he talked about like, oh, why do you have a turtle crossing the road in this scene? It's like, well, I had a turtle and there was a road. And John Favreau comes from that <laughs> saying like, okay, well, what is this about? Well, my friends live in LA. We had cool cars and we were into swing dancing. Boom, a movie. Yeah, there, There's something to that. And then that gets in the territory of like a memoir and it becomes like a fantasy memoir in the way that like Michelle T's fantasy memoirs are. Like Swingers is this hyper-realized version of hanging out with Vince Vaughn and it's singular and cool and interesting. And then he goes on to make all the rat shit. Yeah. You know, like Mandalorian's interesting because it, it is as fan servicey and obvious as any Marvel film, but it still manages to be sort of surprising and pleasing. I have zero interest in Star Wars as a property, but mm-hmm. I think the Mandalorian is actually quite interesting. And I think the thing that makes it interesting is its dedication to the spaghetti western. Well, to the western. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, both atmospherically its pace its soundtrack sometimes it's very obvious but i think it's so refreshing to watch a sci-fi property with the pacing that goes so against other Mm sci-fi contemporary movies and tv shows yeah totally that uh it's actually doing something that's a little interesting even though there's not much plot not much happens it's pretty rote but at least it's like slow and atmospheric. Yeah. When The Mandalorian first came out, I had just seen Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And one of the things that I was, I was struck by was that The Mandalorian is exactly the same kind of Western that Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt's characters are making in the movie that's already oh. sort of passe. It's like an episodic uh, lone wolf hero saving the day each episode. That's really interesting. Um, and, you know, that's what Star Wars is. You know, Star Wars is a mixture of samurai films, World War II fighter jet films, or fighter plane, rather, and westerns. Like, yeah. that's the mix. And they, instead of getting all, like, Transformers, where it's just, like, CGI nightmare or dark future. Like, to me, the worst thing about sci-fi now is it seems incapable of not being a dark future like that's the only future people understand right well verotica is tribute cinema this is paying tribute to european exploitation movies but i i also feel like this is to 70s exploitation movies what hot topic is to like 80s american hardcore yeah i think even hot topic gets it more right than this (laughs) you know because they're just offering the old product repackaged and cheaper you know and curated where I definitely see what you're saying. Like, it, there is a lot of European horror, but it's also learned none the lessons of European horror. Like, don't harshly light the monster because it was it had to be hidden because, like, like all the things that people know, the reason why horror movies are so successful now is people understand the tropes and rules. Yes. This movie seems to, like, be afflicted by the tropes and rules. <laughs> Truly. And even though the most obvious reference points for... Verotica are something like Mario Bava movies. I think it has the most in common with Jess Franco or Jean Roland. 
especially their vampire movies uh, like Vampires Lesbos and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Frisson de Vampire. But the problem is, like those movies, you'll have this like five minute shot of just a topless woman in a headdress slowly walking through a graveyard. Mm -hmm. But it's usually so atmospheric and surreal, whereas this, similar to what you were just saying, seeing a topless woman just kind of sit there and not know what to do with garish, harsh lighting mm -hmm. and a digital camera used incorrectly or used against its best use works against its tribute to those movies because this movie is very slow and atmospheric and boobs like a lot of those exploitation movies yeah but it has no atmosphere those movies are mostly atmosphere yeah do you think that atmosphere might be a, like a consequence of seeing it out of its time you know like so there's like imagine that it was like 1970 and you walked into one of those vampire lesbian movies and like off the street and you were used to like it's it, say it's the seventies and you know, dog day afternoon, the Godfather's out. So like high cinema, like that yeah. does have low touches is already a thing. Like there's grit in cinema and you go see that. Like, do you think that that movie just sucks? Like to the person who sees it at the well, time. When Jean Roland made his first movie, I think it was 68. He put out, uh, the rape of the vampire. There were riots at his theaters and it can be partly blamed on it was May 68 and that's kind of just what, right. what the kids were doing is the rioting. But um, it's kind of conjectured that people who were into horror, European horror cinema at the time were invested in hammer horror films. Mm -hmm. So at least there were even then these conventions, though weird conventions about what a movie should be and his his movies that depended more on Bunuel than in hammer horror films really flew in the face of what people wanted and they kind of freaked out and rejected it mm -hmm. wholly, even though now he's got a certain reverence. I mean, I love his movies, but at the time they did not go over well at all. For me, a film that fits better in that space is Color Out of Space. Yes. Like that movie seems to be more doing... That rhymes more with the time of than this does. To a degree, I think you're right. I mean, I almost feel like this movie is bad in the way that Kiss Meets Phantom of the Park is bad. It's like yes. riding the alleged coolness of something that's really not that cool. It's ineptly made. And I mean, I, even today, like I know people love Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park, especially now that it's kind of hard to find. Oh, but yeah. I remember having like every Kiss tape you could possibly get at Walmart when I was a kid. And then in a bin was Kiss Meets Fan in the Park. I didn't know what it was. Like, cause I didn't have any older brother or older figure introducing to me this shit. I just kind of went down a path and kept on it. So I got this tape. I was like, oh my God, there's a Kiss movie. And the cover was badass. I was like, oh, whoa, this is going to be great. I remember watching it and just being like, this is terrible. Like, I don't know that I like Kiss anymore. Yeah. And, you know, now I think you could be introduced to that movie in a funny kind of like Shatnery way and you would maybe enjoy it. But I just remember you know, as a child without any sort of external training and irony, it was bad and it was disappointing and it was horrifying. Like yeah. I could see if I was the same kid with the misfits and then I saw this, I would be pretty bummed. It's just reminding me of how many times I've come across people talking about the Phantom Menace and saying that they went and saw it in the theater three or four times before they finally conceded that it was a bad movie. I mean, see it like halfway through. I was so sad. Yeah, but so many people are so invested in Star Wars. They were confronted by one of the biggest Hollywood monstrosities in the history of cinema and had to keep going back to recognize its failure. I've actually got a book called uh, Lost Girls sitting here, and it's all entirely essays about the cinema of Jean Roland. And I, there's just a quote that's sort of like, is about what I was just talking about, about his uh, movie, Rape of the Vampire, and about exactly what we were talking about earlier, where he says, Le viol du vampire is, I totally killed that pronunciation, thank you, is a remarkably confident piece that works with the refreshing notion of daring to leave some mistakes in. Roland, too wrapped up in the adventure of making the film itself to be bothered with an expectation of cinematic perfection. So even he is sort of running with this thing of like, I'm making a surreal film. It's not supposed to be perfect. And it's such a slippery thing to let things go. Mm -hmm. And what do you let go? I mean, you know, we 
you and I talk about punk as this reference point a lot, but like a lot of what punk is, is about the failures within it. Mm -hmm. But what are the failures that are part of its charm? And when are those failures a limitation that makes it unlistenable? If you only know three chords and you fucking lean into them really hard, people can potentially overlook your lack of musical depth. Mm -hmm. But if you're not able to play with any sense of rhythm and can't follow the bass and drums, that is potentially cannot be overlooked, right? Yeah. But it's just another form of musical skill that you may or may not have. But this film seems to, Veronica, fail on everything. If you went to film school and took your entire lesson plan mm -hmm. and went through it piece by piece, this movie will fail on every page. I mean, it like when I was thinking, we were talking, like texting about like, oh, wouldn't it be funny to do a shot by shot remake of this with drag queens called Herotica? Yes. And like, we could probably do that for $10,000 and it would be as fun. It would be funnier than this was. Probably. You know, and it's weird that, like, I mean, I, and I don't even like talking about movies like this. This is not like a way I like to discuss <laughs> movies. It's like just a cold, totally shit on something. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm not even like, offended by it because i was such a fan like to me like once danzig leaves the misfits i don't give a fuck about him like i i like mother whatever who cares like after that it's one he, cute song good he's for him a comical figure in some ways and, and you know speaking of danzig and comedy he's so funny in those portlandia goth skits that when i saw that this movie was like schlocky i expected this movie to be great like i was expecting right. it to be really really fun and kind of like you know like at least is as good as like a jennifer's body or something like that like kind of like that that's kind of what i was expecting this movie to be yeah or have like you know rob zombie has his taste something else i was thinking about though is obviously Z rob zombie and glenn danzig have like slightly differing aesthetics but i wonder if like the decision to not add like grindcore overlays and color textures was sort of like a differentiation from Tarantino um, or something. Like, yeah, like, oh, I don't want to play the game. But then again, it's like, I look at Glenn Danzig's music over his career. You know, when he was a punk and it was punk times, he made punk albums. But as it went on, it's this very, like, studio-produced, warmed-over Iron Maiden metal that, like, who the fuck wants any of this nonsense? And this is the oral equivalent to, like, late Danzig albums. Yeah. It's just uninteresting, a taste of what used to be around... I think that's fair. Just goth and bloated. <laughs> <laughs> but the movies that he is paying tribute to with Verotica is something he's been invested in his whole life. Mm -hmm. Early Misfit songs are named after B-movies, are based on the plots of B-movies. Mm -hmm. So this is something he's been immersed in. This isn't foreign terrain to him. Yeah. But, you know, then I also have to get back to, like, this the whole thing that, like, has been really... I've been thinking about is I've been reading like Schopenhauer's writing about like critics and stuff like that is like, it's, it would be better to be the worst filmmaker than the best critic. And like, I've always kind of felt like that, like, Oh, I've never made anything good. But for some reason, this movie was just so disappointing and it felt so like, I'll give almost any movie that comes out a pass because like, dude, you fucking made this movie. Sure. Like, this is incredible. It's more than I've ever done and probably ever will do this one. I, I feel very comfortable shitting on. Yeah. Like, yeah. What do you think of the migration of some porn actors to quote legit or Hollywood or? I mean, you know, to me, like the only reason why they, there's two reasons why they wouldn't be able to move laterally. One is stigma, which I think is fucking lame. Yep. Like I, I think it's awful. And the other is just talent, you know? So maybe these people are just, just don't have it as credible actors but you know you think about the people who have sort of crossed over they always cross over with an asterisk so it's like tracy mm -hmm. lords or uh, sasha gray and entourage they're both fine you know like yeah. tracy lords is hilarious and crybaby she's really great yeah i think it's stigma because i think that that stigma is the case for it's not just about porn but hollywood mm -hmm. is such this bizarre system that is almost as much of a, I wouldn't call it a vetting process, but it's almost like if you were trying to become a senator mm -hmm. 
things that don't work will keep you out. Yeah. And I don't mean if you're a wild child or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's just, my God, if you're a woman, your head has to have a certain proportion to your waist and your eyes have to be set apart at just the exact right distance for you to be even allowed to be considered for certain price point films. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that you've actually had penetrative sex on camera would just eliminate you from the majority of roles. The fetish with which people devour these leaked nudes that happened like a couple of years ago, especially, mm -hmm. I think we might cross over into an era where none of this shit matters anymore. I mean, Hollywood might slowly evaporate to where like YouTube stars have more power, which they're starting to. I mean, and so if that YouTube star has done porn, like that wouldn't even be a factor, right? Yeah. If your favorite YouTube star had done five years of porn, that would just be part of their interesting backstory. It wouldn't be a complicated thing that you'd contend with. Like we have to think about Mel Gibson as an anti-Semite. I mean, a great example, right? Cardi B like, is a great example. That's a, you know, a stripper. I think she might've been a prostitute too, but like that's somebody who was like a sex figure before she oh, became really? this like gigantic figure. I think there like might be just a bit of like just elitism involved too. Cause like, Fully. I mean, it's not the same, but like, wrestlers who kind of come over to be actors uh -huh. are never really given their their full due like you know like rowdy rowdy piper like it like they live is fucking great and he's pretty fun in it but pretty fun but not a, you not there's a great always actor. but you're always like i'm looking at a wrestler and like same yes, thing with yes. like, like diamond dallas page and rob zombies movies like you're like oh that's a wrestler um to a certain extent gina carano and haywire you know or you know right. you're, you're just so aware good. it's like you're aware of the thing that she was and maybe it's like something like like athletes have the same thing you know it's, it's something about like using your body in a specific way that is not part of hollywood it, there could be something to that but i mean and then also just old-fashioned sexism you know like like for sure your hoes are not treated well by society in general that's a fact so what do you make of the way <laughs> the issue of women in veronica what do you make of it well i mean so there's a whole bunch of different things you could say about like women porn stars that look like this, you know, like the male gaze forces them to look that, or lately is it they, they, they want, they grow up looking at women like that themselves and just won't always wanted to be like that. You know, is it an empowering thing? Who knows? You get the feeling though, that Glenn Danzig enjoys and appreciates these women for what they are and who they are. And if there's one thing I guess I could say positive about this is that he has attempted to lovingly shoot these porn stars and prostitutes in a way that makes them look appealing. Prostitutes? Porn, or whatever they porn are, stars. porn stars, whatever yeah. they are, yeah. <laughs> a little different. Isn't there blurred lines with the whole like the, the only a lot of porn stars actually do escorting? Well, I think that making that jump is the same as saying that they all have daddy issues, whether it's true or not, is secondary to the fact that unless they say that that's what's going on, that's not necessarily what's going on. Yeah, I have one friend who's a porn actor, and. I was his friend before, I'm his friend after, you know, it's like in your mind, you're always like, well, this is a pretty extreme thing to have done, but mm -hmm. I, in my just general, like not non-judgmental, like not really caring about what other people do. It, it's just hard for me to really get razzed about it. You know, no, if I was single and somebody was like, oh, I was a porn star, I would be like, oh, great, fine. No, you know, I, I, I can I are friends with an AVN award-winning oh, porn star cool. and he was an award-winning porn star because he was such a good actor he could sell a scene. Hmm. Yeah, it's funny. There's a lot of writing about this movie as being misogynist. And I mean, I think it's complicated in the way that people writing about slasher movies in the 80s as being misogynist mm -hmm. is, yeah, it's an easy case to make, but it's also an easy case to make that this movie is almost entirely strong women. Yeah, once you get under the hood, it just doesn't wash. You know what I mean? Like, if you're just some moralizing person who doesn't really care about the, the genre in general, like, it, you're, you're just not going to get it. Like, the whole men, with women, and chainsaws thing just seems like it's just an unimpeachable thesis to me. You know, it just, yes, I could imagine that a lot of my just general liking of women, and especially women who can take care of themselves, has a lot to do with horror movies. Yeah. But something that is... I find fascinating about these, whatever, special, elevated, trash, whatever, the the Pantheon is that, well, okay, two things. Uh, uh, let's say 
Miami Connection, Troll 2, Birdemic, The Room. These are all movies made by egomaniacal men whose English is their second language and their ideas don't translate well to American cinema, but they Mm -hmm. went ahead and made an American movie anyway. And then we're left with these gems. But the secondary thing is almost all of the movies that are in this huge canon of elite trash all have really weird relationships with women. Not necessarily misogynist, but weird. Like this movie is all about boobs, Mm -hmm. right? That's pretty much what this movie is. Topless women with implants. Mm -hmm. And Tommy Wiseau, his issues with women are like fucking complicated. Troll 2, same thing. It's often these men just sort of like letting their inner monologue about women just sort of like spiral out of control on this cinema that already doesn't make much sense. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is another example of that is I wouldn't call this film misogynist by any means, but it certainly does have an odd take on women and representing them. Also, all of the women in this movie are, quote, beautiful in some way, right? In some traditional sense. Mm -hmm. But a lot of them, they have the signifiers of hotness, but are actually kind of peculiar looking, like have the implants that are far too big Mm -hmm. and look odd. Or their lips are so plumped up that they're uncanny. There's Mm -hmm. a lot of like uncanny hotness in Mm -hmm. this movie alongside other women who are just sort of like more, I don't know, it's a more mellow kind of beauty, I guess. Does that make sense? Yeah, which is more, I mean, definitely like obvious surgical enhancement is weird. It's like when somebody restores an old vintage car with like a candy flip flop paint, you know what I mean? It's (laughs) calling attention to itself in, in in a way that is very specific. Right. But when we're talking about human bodies, it's primal for us to read these cues so hypervigilantly that it's very odd. It's like the uncanny valley comes into play. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, like, I've never even been in the running to date a woman with like weird stripper enhancements, I guess we'd call them like just, you know, obviously like I've never, it's never been an option. So I, I wonder if like, you know, how I would even feel about that. If like a girl like this was hitting on me at the bar and I was single, like I would probably sleep with her for sure. <laughs> you know, like, but it's like, you know, I dated goths. Goths go out of their way to look a certain way. Sure. You know, so. Yep. Now, I think the surgery thing is always a little weird because surgery just is fucking scary no matter what. So it's like, you're always like, to me, you're just rolling the dice anytime any doctor's involved. It's a very odd, uncanny choice to lean into surgical alterations that make you more cartoonish Mm -hmm. and what cartoonish is is you know in the eye of the beholder and to have chosen all of that for a film too you know but then again like look at wes anderson he's choosing actresses and actors that have like a quirk absolutely you know so he's he's done the same thing and john waters again you know for for sure sure so i mean i i I have to think of the scene in uh my base level thing I always look back on when I think about aesthetics is the character in Boogie Nights, the black dude that dresses like a cowboy yes. and like his constant anxiety over how he's going to represent himself in the world aesthetically. It's yeah. just like, it's just so, and because I really relate to that character because like I, I just look bad in clothes. So like anytime I've tried to look a certain way, it just goes wrong. It just doesn't look like when I was like trying to be a goth, I just looked stupid you know or, or any any outfit i've tried to like my friend eric always says no matter what i have on it's gonna look like a costume which is a bit true but the whole dialogue in boogie nights when he's like just where would you dig man and that along with the moment where jordan peele knew where he could be a director and his friend said directing is just about taste you have taste right so it's it's about like there's an assurance in your aesthetic that i think some people have and i would imagine that Danzig is probably pretty sure of his aesthetic, having committed to it for the last 40 plus years. Um, And maybe that's where the confidence of this film came from. Right. I don't know. But I mean, that's a roundabout way of saying like, you just wear what you dig, I guess. And if what you dig is surgical enhancements, fine. Oh, for sure. I think there's also thinking about this a little more, just film what you dig. So Danzig loves boobs. And turns out if you just, have a movie that focuses on a woman's chest for shots that go on too long. It's 
even if you like boobs too, it gets really boring. Yeah. Well, like it's like too much of a good thing. I mean, the other thing that this movie's not doing that horror, good horror films do is like, what anxiety is this addressing? Each scene could have been a heavy metal album cover, you know, and okay. So now, now yeah. what? You it's, know, what? It's, it's trying to define an aesthetic and an atmosphere, but doesn't have much atmosphere. And I think that's a, a big failure is that we could complain about there not being a story. It's like, well, that's not fair. I don't think it's supposed to have a story. I don't think there's supposed to be a narrative. I don't think there's supposed to be a resolution. Mm-hmm. It's horror, but I don't think it's trying to do the things that we normally associate with a horror movie. I think that what it's doing is paying tribute to a certain era and style of cinema, but the way in which it approaches it doesn't match the aesthetic, which Mm. is surrealism and atmosphere and a tension between sex and violence, you know, violent erotica, Mm -hmm. verotica. It's not very erotic and it's the violence is not very, uh, there's no tension. Well, the violence is totally unconvincing. Like, I mean, everything from the way that people handle guns to where the way people get stabbed. So the way people go like, what are you doing? And just stand there and don't run away. Like, yeah, nobody tries to get free. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is a world where like Mandy came out two years ago, you know, like, so that, that, that is an absurd, violent, heavy metal cover inspired thing. And it's, I think, a work of art. Yeah. What do you think about artists working outside their lane. And we talked about Rod's, Rob Zombie, mm-hmm. who's a really interesting artist in general, who obviously, if you just check out his music and his videos, you can see that there is a vision there. Yeah. I've been thinking a lot about this in the context of right now, because there's nothing else for them to do, every celebrity is now a, a policy expert, right? Like, oh, and, and it's so, the worst. And Another t- reason to hate Twitter. Yeah. And so, like, I think... I would never want somebody to stay in a lane because it's like, I mean, what you're, you're supposed to only do one thing forever. Yes. But somebody should definitely be aware that genius in one le- one realm does not translate to genius in another realm. Like there's definitely the thing, like the Miyato Musashi, Miyamoto Musashi thing where it's like if you know the way broad in, in one thing, you will know the way broadly. So if you're an expert sword fighter, you could probably figure out how to do haiku and poetry and and dancing and all the other samurai shit well, but not necessarily. Like, exactly. you know, not necessarily. And, and It sounds good to say so. It's a yeah. beautiful maxim about life and about excellence, yeah. but it's only true when it's true. I mean, like another example, Elon Musk made the best electric car that anyone has ever made so far. You know, it's, it, it's popular. It's at production level. It's it, like he nailed it. His COVID shit seems pretty off. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it, it, it's like, okay, like, whoa, what's going on here? You know, like, it, and then you see other people who just do it all. Like, I mean, a fucking Sinatra could act, sing, dance, the whole deal. Like, there were people who could do a lot of different things and their lanes were broader. Um, and we're also part, we're in an age where, like, the professional dilettante is a thing. Like, that's what Joe Rogan is. He's very good at a whole bunch of different things that touch a lot of interesting intersections, but. He's not like world class in any of the things, you know, but in his, in the whole appeal to him is he's out there just trying different things and learning about different things. And so he has this meta skill of being a fun person to hang out with while you're exploring something. Yeah. But he shouldn't be setting policy, you know. Like, oh, good God. Although, yeah. throw him on a cabinet, see what happens. <laughs> Let him fight it out with a bunch of other lunatics. I mean, who knows? Yeah. Although one thing in what you said is excellence. I have serious questions as to whether Glenn Danzig, who I do appreciate Misfits and Samhain quite a bit, Mm. I don't know that there's excellence there. I think I have a different perspective on what even excellence in art means than you. I think we kind of have some Mm. fundamental disagreements about that sort of thing. But I don't look at Glenn Danzig and think of someone who, even in the 80s, like he is excellent at that. I think it's more that punk rock and the way it worked in that moment could hold up a lens to the weirdness that he was Mm. in a way that was interesting. So the Misfits were great, but that doesn't necessarily mean they were incredible artists. It's more like there were a bunch of kids who tapped into something for a window of time that was very compelling and very weird. 
but that doesn't necessarily mean Glenn Danzig is a great artist in one thing. I wonder if it'll translate to another. I There's no part of me that sees, hey, Glenn Danzig made a movie, and I'd be like, oh, I bet it's good, whereas Rob Zombie made a movie, like, oh, I bet that might be interesting. I don't know, man. Like, I mean, you got to yeah. look back at, like, this might be fair to say that I'm more invested in the misfits than you are. Sure. In sure. general. Yeah. And when I'm, when I'm thinking about the misfits, I'm thinking about, it was weird to be a bodybuilder Elvira in 1979. Sure. You know, like just sure. from a, a performance art being like candy darling at, you know, Warhol scene or something like that. Like right. the, 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 to be Glenn Danzig, just to simply be that at that time and perform like that is interesting and unusual and weird. Yeah. And, all those albums jam, you know, like, like, the, like I could listen right now and have a good time listening to any Danzig album, any, any Misfits Danzig album. And, you know, the t-shirts were cool. The zines that came out at the time were cool. You know, you look at interviews back then, it has more to do with like an Anton LaVey performance artist to me than like, say, I don't know who would be an equivalent, like a Kanye West, for example, right? Like that, he's somebody who's like trying to do artistic things in a bunch of different fields. And I'm just using his him as an example because of how wide it is. It's like he makes albums and he designs shoes. I'm not going to say whether or not the shoes succeed or not, but they're like the hottest shoes to get. Like Yeezys are super popular. So 2024. I mean, for sure. Like, <laughs> I mean, the only, you know, he was on the ballot in California, like as the vice president. And I looked into Did that. Did I see that? Yeah. So I looked into that party a little bit. It's kind of like a white power party. It's like a Nazi, like, so like way back in the eighties, they had like some sort of like Nazi association. It's, it's just so weird to think that like. <laughs> this country is so off the rails. <laughs> that's what I was telling somebody that the other day, like they were talking about like this Michigan militia guys that tried to kidnap the governor yep. there about like, oh, they're a white power militia. I was like, they're not. They are as dangerous and weird and fucked up as your standard, like, 1980s-style white power militia. But, like, the dangerous thing is their politics are so unusual and, like, non-mainstream that people are going to have a hard time wrapping their head around it. And, like, it's going to be difficult to, like, spot. Like, for example, in the 80s, if somebody walked up wearing their stupid fucking clan outfit like they thought was fine back then, like, you would look at that and be like, well, I'm obviously not into this. But, like, you know, the, I think the where people were really afraid of the alt-right in a right way was that like they, they were sort of assimilating a little bit. And you're like, well, I'm just a tech blogger. And you're like, uh, do what? Like, you're not just that, you know? So I think these weird things that have been enabled by the internet, like these weird intersections of bad ideas, like, like in the way that we have intersections that we love and care about, like there are, Spanish fascist Nintendo fans that like love Pinochet and Luigi, you know, like what do you do with that? Like, I don't know. Like, do they form art groups and do we care about them 30 years from now? I don't know. Yeah. Hopefully not. But if you were going to recast <laughs> this movie and you were going to recast Morella, like the main, main, like kind of crypt keeper character, like who would you want to, in your version of this film, if you got the script for Veronica, right. like what would you do with it? Well, if Caden Cross was already attached, I'd be like, great, let's work on your lines and give you something cool to do and say. Mm -hmm. I'm sure she could pull it off because she's, she's beautiful and can act. Mm -hmm. I think she's one of those people like, camera loves her. You yeah. know, she's one of those people. And this movie is full of people that camera doesn't love. Yeah. But who would I cast, like, from scratch? Give me, I, give I don't me a wanna, second okay, on that. I'll That's... give you a second, but I want to make a comment while you're oh. thinking about it, which is that, like, what would have sold her more is what Jackass, the Crypt Keeper, and the Muppets all have in common, which is, like, when somebody is a thing, there's a bunch of, like, accoutrement. So somebody's a chef, there's a cleaver, a chef hat, a pot with a lobster going in it. Right. You know, like, whether it be, like, like, you could imagine that same set of, like, gag items with like a jackass episode or like the muppet show or like tales from the crypt like you know like the crypt keeper would come out as like a french director with a beret like that sort of thing in between scenes would have been more fun yes although she had those stupid fucking horns poking through her yeah wig. like what is she like a Terrible. succubus yeah, like so what, what's dumb. going on here oh made me so mad you must have an answer okay if somebody gave me this script and a million dollars and said, we want you to make this successful, 
I would just go get a bunch of hot YouTubers. Like I would do what boo, mm. I would boot Medea boo. Like that's what I would do is yeah. I would, I would do it exactly the same way. I would have some sort of like hilarious person as the centerpiece and then a bunch of uh, like wink and nod weirdo. But I guess that's kind of what this is. Like, I mean, I guess I just don't watch the right porn to like know who these people are. Maybe I would care if I was like a AVN interested person like maybe just going to the convention every year fanning well, like, out I like you I mean, you mentioned the girl Kane Cross like I was supposed to know her and I don't know who she is who? like Kaden Cross oh, yeah. like, I, I have no idea who she is well she is someone who's been I think trying to uh, make her way into Hollywood slowly like she was into speaking of all this stuff about B cinema and all that she was in Samurai Cop 2 Deadly Vengeance which mm. Samurai Cop is one of the elite terrible movies and then they remade it but with so much irony that it kind of didn't work anymore. Mm-hmm. They were paying tribute to it as a sequel and with a lot of layers of irony, and she was in that. So I think she's, like, trying to get outside of her... I don't know. She's probably eight. I don't know how old she is, but like like all porn actors, you have some decisions to make, I assume. You yeah. drop out, marry rich, go start a company, go get a job somewhere regular where your history in porn isn't really going to step on your toes direct or try to maybe go legit kind of sort of because you like filmmaking and just want to stay stay around cameras and it strikes me that she's maybe trying to do that but it's you know like we just said it's an uphill battle like it's not like sasha gray is suddenly starring in marvel movies after girlfriend experience with soderbergh or something no Soderbergh's sort of like the dream killer, man. You ever, he always like tries to like resurrect these people from like one thing into another thing. And you're like, oh, he made a movie with this person. And then like, they don't really ever go anywhere. I mean, like Gina Carana's in The Mandalorian, but that probably has more. Oh, yeah. to, I think that probably has more to do with the fact that Jon Favreau is an MMA fan than it does. Oh, that's funny. You know? Yeah. So when you're asking about Crypt Keeper, do you mean porn actors? Or just any, any, because I don't know from porn actor names, except for like Tracy Lords, who's like our age or older. Um, Dame, Dame Judi Dench. As the main character? As As the the... Crypt Keeper. She would, she would kill it so hard. And who else though? Oh, just as actors? Yeah. Oh, well then it's a free for all. I mean, is it this script? Oh, the detective? The Rock, for sure. Imagine The Rock is the detective. Yeah, but that might also be because the detective probably was like, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this like The Rock," because he, he, he was so badass, and yeah. yeah, he probably has a photo of The Rock somewhere in his office. I mean, I do, or in his gym. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wonder where like he found that guy, you know? Because everybody else, like, you could see like. Danzig met them at a strip club. Like, like no. all that other stuff makes a lot of sense. Exactly. You but know? he is, he seems like he was hired as an actor from a casting call. Yeah. Or something. Yeah. Yeah. And like the bouncers seem like they were bouncers at that strip club. Like, sure. I think one of them's a wrestler that was, uh, I, I just know this from the Red Letter Media uh, breakdown of this, that he was the, one of the bouncers is a wrestler who was also in a sex tape with China, who was also a wrestler. China the wrestler? Yes. Jesus Christ. Yeah, I didn't I, I didn't even know there was like this world of like WWE sex tapes other than Hulk Hogan's, which famously destroyed Gawker, but that's kind of a different thing. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. That. that was my, I mean, now that we can kind of talk about this safely, my theory of why, and this, it'll be fun later to see how wrong this was, but my theory of why nobody, no mainstream news outlets picked up the Biden sex tape thing had less to do with like politics than it did with the critical destruction of the businesses that ran the Hulk Hogan sex tapes like Biden, like like Hunter Biden's sex tapes, I think would have met the same criteria of an expectation of privacy. So there was this weird thing with the Hulk Hogan tape where he was so famous, the news couldn't resist publishing them, but there was the expectation of privacy, which is a violation. It's, it's super illegal. And then a lot of times celebrities don't get that, privacy even like yeah. you know you're, they're sitting on the front lawn of their house and a boob slips out somebody takes a picture like it's like oh well they're famous so it doesn't pass yeah but, so i felt like so many people just avoided that whole thing because they were like we're not publishing any of this shit because it could fucking destroy us the way gawker got destroyed mm. i don't know just a very yeah, like, yeah, like yeah. a conspiracy theory sort of thing but that's oh, sort of based. it's very john grishamy 
Like, you know, like a very peculiar law over here affects this weird crime over here. Right. I don't know. But that is all behind us now, much like this movie. I kind of wanted to talk about boredom. Yeah, sure. I've been bored a lot lately. Now that, now, <laughs> now that we've been talking about this for three hours. At the risk of talking about The Room again, mm. uh, it's such an easy reference, I feel like. It's just the one that makes sense, you know? It's the most popular after Ed Wood, the movie Ed Wood, and its focus on Plan 9 of outer, from Outer Space, which was regarded as the worst film ever made mm. until like the 90s and up until now, where it's sort of been replaced by more recent versions. I feel like The Room is that status now. It's the easiest reference point mm. where... I feel like people, everybody used to know about Plan 9 from Outer Space. It was so infamous. And now everybody knows about The Room. Mm -hmm. But one of the key differences between this and The Room is that this movie is quite boring. There are slow parts in The Room. Mm -hmm. But this movie is mostly slow parts. Yeah. And I think that a trouble spot for Danzig in making this movie as a tribute to these atmospheric surrealist films is that minimalism when it's at its best has fine attention to detail. Mm -hmm. And so pacing, slow pacing in a movie definitely requires something of the audience, especially contemporary audiences. But there has to be something to linger on. Mm -hmm. There has to be a depth in that stillness. And this film lacks that. Like I was saying about the Jean Roland films or Jess Franco, there's an atmosphere that those filmmakers build that you don't have to like. You, you can also think it's boring and bullshit. Mm -hmm. But this movie doesn't even have that. That there isn't the attention to detail and atmosphere. Yeah. And so it's just kind of boring. Yeah, like there's long strip club scenes where the camera is just held. I mean, you think about another film where the camera is just held really long is uh, there's all the scenes in Clockwork Orange where Stan yep. Stanley Kubrick just holds on Alex's face and just moves in super slow. By describing it like that, it just sounds very boring. But you're focusing on the totally amazing, insane face that Malcolm McDowell makes. You yep. know? So it's like you're, you're seeing something else there. But this... Like, there's just a lot of parts that are just boring. Like, I went back and tried to watch it a second time just to make... I couldn't do it, man. I was just, like, yeah. skipping through it every few minutes. And especially the third one, yep. the third vignette with the Elizabeth Bathory type shit is just so boring. It's, like, unbelievably yeah. boring. Yeah. All the, it's hard to frame because, like, Jim Jarmusch, which a lot of people don't like his early movies, yeah. but... You know, like down by law, some of the scenes, like, someone takes a drag off their cigarette, maybe. Just, yeah. it's a bunch of people bored. Yeah. sometimes and it's kind of interesting tim burton in an interview when he was talking about making ed wood when he talked about like whether or not ed wood's films were terrible he said y well you have to look at some of the stuff obviously is terrible he's like but there's also things that are so contemporary that you'd never seen before that you see now in like david lynch so like a close-up of an ear when someone's listening or something like that there were these things that ed wood did that other people do that mm. seem that end up being interesting but that's definitely not what's happening in veronica interesting yeah, yeah i can see that i think also discomfort can be a really useful tool to mm -hmm. use aesthetically to make your audience uncomfortable but i think that the amount of discomfort there is through this film is not to its benefit it mm -hmm. it is not using audience discomfort as a tone setting device, it's just uncomfortable because it keeps not doing anything or you can feel the discomfort of the actors, which again, could be interesting if that was something he was doing. I mean, I feel like Lars von Trier, for example, mm -hmm. or Kubrick uses the genuine discomfort of his performers to create something on screen. The but Texas Chainsaw. Like for perfect, yeah. sure. But here you can feel like the actors are just so awkwardly wondering what the fuck's going on or something. Well, they're pros, right? So they're probably used to being in uncomfortable scenes, but getting sure. jizzed on. So, But at least if you're a porn actor, you know what to do with downtime. 
Mm -hmm. And in between takes, like, you know what your role is. Right. That's your job. And here, you're Elizabeth Bathory and you're bathing in blood. Go. Like, well, what? For how long? (laughs) Yeah. What do do I do with my hands? Am I out of frame? Am I in frame? Can you see the blood in the tub? It feels like there are a million questions that are not answered for the Mm -hmm. performers that would be good to know if you were in that scene. So the actors are sort of stiff and not really in the scene. Yeah, It's interesting how like different directors, I I only know this from like behind the scenes footage of things. Like, for example, I watched like a documentary about Tyler Perry yesterday. I keep bringing him up, but there, like there was a scene where he was working with an actress and he's like describing to her how she feels and wants her to like bring in some tragedy from her life to like kind of make it feel. So he's like there very much like directing her, like telling her what to do. And, and you see other some other people just to kind of like let the camera roll. Like it seems like Herzog sort of does that a little bit. You know, he just assembles weirdos and let them rip. How do you think you would be as a director? Like, do you think you would be very micromanagey or just kind of like more documentary? <laughs> well, funny you should say that. When I, I went to the Vancouver Film School and that school is basically an assembly line into the industry, uh, the Hollywood North of Vancouver. Mm-hmm. And Everybody had to spend a week in one position. So you spend a week learning everything about sound, and then you rotate to everything about the camera, to everything about editing. And when it was my turn to direct, I actually got pulled aside by my teacher and said, like, Mark, you got to mellow the hell off. Mm. You're done directing the scene because I think your actors have had enough of you. And from that, I think I had a big life lesson about not trying to control other people and letting things do what they need to do. So I think if I was suddenly a director of a film again, I would actually be the opposite of my instinct in that moment, which was to control the shit out of it and let people do their fucking job. I feel like that teacher sucks because like... Well, the caveat is that when those actors did my scene, they knew all their lines and they didn't know their lines for any of the other scenes. That's kind of what I'm getting at, <laughs> which is like intensity often wins. And so if, you're, if your instruction to someone is to be less intense, I think that's bad advice. Like, I mean, it, that'd be, the difference would be like you're working in a, I mean, I was going to say you're working in a warehouse or something like that. But even then, like the people who I've worked with who've had the most like crazy success are really intense. Like, I mean, you hear about Kubrick shooting a movie like 55 times. Like you, things are referred to as Kubrickian. They're not referred to as like nice guy. in. I think if I was going to shoot a movie, I would do like, I would assemble misfits. Like I would just get the, the weirdest possible people sure. to do that were capable and then workshop the fuck out of it and then just let it go. Like with a, like I, I, I like films that are kind of made like that. I don't think I would be too heavy handed. I avoid situations in which I have too much power. It's funny, this comes back to what you were saying earlier, not on the topic of this film, but some people are better than others and that sort of thing. Mm. I actually am very invested in non-hierarchical structures around art. I don't think that works in every situation, mm. but that's that's interesting to me in art. I like collaborating with people with equality. That's my current band. It's like, it's two of us and we both have our roles and... Neither of us has a bigger say in anything, and it's great. It works for us. Yeah. And so if I was a director, I think I would be invested in figuring out how it can function as a collaborative process instead of a strictly top-down process, Mm -hmm. which obviously works for some people and has contributed to a lot of my favorite art, obviously. But I'm so invested in like anti-fascist thinking and politics and art that I would really want to explore how that can function on a film set, which is precarious because yeah. films kind of lend itself to a certain kind of auteurness. Yeah. I mean, I guess that comes down to like, you could have somebody in charge in a fascist sort of way, or you could have somebody in charge because they're a heroic figure. So this is like in the Iliad, this is Agamemnon, Agamemnon versus Achilles. You know, like they're both these sort of like controlling figures who men fight for but Agamemnon is a fascist and Achilles is just great. And so people follow him. And then the, the conflict is between like the fascist good, like greatness and the heroic greatness. Like in, when Achilles won't fight anymore because Agamemnon took his slave. That's great. It's hilarious. But also, if I can put it as an yeah. aside, I think also my lack of tolerance for fools mm-hmm. is sometimes so crippling that I wouldn't want to put myself in a position where I get to squash that fucking person. 
think about how much control was required to make Vast of Night. Yeah. Like when we were asking about the di- the dialogue in that film is excellent and it's really fun and snappy. And you look at it and you're like, we would ask like how much of it's ad lib, you know, it just seems so smooth and fun, but it's all like totally scripted, totally workshop, totally down. Yep. You don't get that without control. You know, like somebody has to be in charge. That doesn't like. Uh, but for that movie, but there are lots of movies that are very improvisational. I mean, uh, the majority of what's his name? Pineapple Express and. Superbad and 40 year old virgin and those all those movies are Seth Rogen Seth Rogen and Mm. family Um, well they're all so improvisational and you see the outtakes and it's just a bunch of guys hanging out clowning around they're comedians you know what I mean they're like people playing basketball it's like they're they're skilled Um, but again it that's just a way of doing things that works for that situation that would not work in Vast of Night I mean, the perfect, like, I, like, I would rather make a movie like This is the End than a movie like Vast of Night. And not even rather, like, I would be incapable of making Vast of Night. Right. I could maybe pull off This is the End. Right. But, but mostly that's about, like, the curation of odd people onto one spot, which I feel pretty confident I could pick weirdos. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there's that YouTube channel that's, uh, like, scripts and scenes or something like that where it runs the script next to the person. And it, it's interesting to see how, like, the people who... I've watched a few of them now, and the people that we think of as like real, real auteur directors, the script is so close to what you see on the screen. Mm-hmm. Like, even, right. even there's like a couple, maybe one or two slight phrase changes, but then you look at Richard Linkletter, and the like, I, I just read Matthew McConaughey's biography, and he talks about the scene that everybody knows that made Matthew McConaughey all right, all right, all right, completely ad libbed. Yep. It was his first time in hair and makeup. He wasn't even supposed to be there that day. They just had him in costume in his car. They said, go get in your car. And like, it might be interesting if you hit on this girl. It's not in the script, whatever. And it becomes like one of the most iconic scenes in film. I mean, it's a legend. Like, I mean, Matthew McConaughey had talked about how like he just runs into people with it tattooed on them. And like, it's, it's just such a thing. And like, everybody knows it, you know? So that you only get that from like a Richard Linkletter just like sitting back and like letting things happen. Yeah. I, it, you know, I guess you just got to know what kind of person you are. What you, you should just go with what makes you comfortable. Yeah. And maybe this is what made the Glenn Danzig comfortable. Harsh lighting on these boobs. <laughs> <laughs> and he's right. <laughs> I mean, I guess, uh, you know, another layer to this, speaking of harsh lighting on boobs is, I love the idea of paying tribute to that era of exploitation cinema and some like Amer is a, mm-hmm. is an amazing version of how that can be done. Well, Mandy sort of is it's a different mm-hmm. kind of film, but what's odd is exploitation cinema is just a different thing. Now it's mm-hmm. one thing to pay hom- homage to it. It is another thing to consider what, what is exploitation in art at this point. There is a certain irony in hiring porn stars to be in your kind of sexy film when you can in 10 seconds look at that person getting double teamed on your phone Hmm. so what is like sexy exploitation cinema with porn stars that are one click away from like fully going at it and probably finding hours of that material anyway so what is this long lingering shot of their breasts in red and green light doing i mean who knows i you mean you know it's like the, the like soft core i, I actually I, do you subscribe to hbo no mm-mm. right well hbo sort of had a faux cinemax that if you went to this sub menu to this sub menu they had adult movies that were quite chaste porn where there was a lot of weird things blocking Mm-hmm. You know, so you wouldn't actually see. Yeah, who is that shit for? I don't know. Yeah, they they stopped doing it. They just cut yeah. it recently, and I can't believe it lasted that long because who pays for HBO but doesn't have internet? <laughs> yeah, it's super weird. Like, like, uh, like your main interface into the world now is the internet, and it is trying to force porn at you so aggressively. <laughs> so why would you resort to? So I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it's like motorcycles. Like, if it's not like the fastest or the coolest, what's the point of it? 
well, if the fastest and the coolest cost the same. Right, that's what I mean. And, and are just like, as available. Just another layer of bafflement for this movie. Before we started recording, we were talking with Monique about how much a lot of us have slid in our hygiene and dressing up during COVID, but it's just as easy to put on nice pants as it is to put on sweats. It's not more complicated. You mm. are making a choice. So why make the shittier choice? I don't know. I mean, the only way I would ever sit through this shit again is if there was a director commentary. Like I would that love would be to interesting. Hear, I, I, it would be interesting to me to hear, are we just missing it? Yep. You know, because I, I I like to read a lot of like stuff from like 30s and 40s and sometimes it'll be like cultural things. Have you ever read like a contemporary review of a classic that was just poorly reviewed at the time? Mm, I don't know. Maybe. Like, for example, like... You, I mean, you, like Lovecraft, for example. Right. I mean, Lovecraft <laughs> is a good example. Um, but, I mean, books are always a little weird to review for people because it seems like such a hurdle to even get somebody to watch something. But, like, there are reviews of Star Wars, for example, something that's just generally well loved at the time, that just rail against it. Well, Psycho was destroyed by the press yeah. at the time. And now it's the er horror film. Yeah. You know? it, I, I can't imagine that this would be like that. No, but you could imagine, to what you were saying earlier, this movie having some sort of strange second life where if there was a really bizarre director's commentary or a disaster artist or a remake by Drag Queens, as you said, um, mm -hmm. you could see that someone could do something with this and give it a bigger life than it has already. And I would kind of love that because, okay, this is a really bad movie, but... The guy from The Misfits hired a bunch of porn stars to make a film with a lot of boobs. Like, there's a lot already there, mm -hmm. and it failed, but, like, could someone take that and spin it into something that does work? Maybe. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, <laughs> the fact that this might be our longest episode we've ever done, and we're not even done talking, is, I think, slightly a testament to there's something happening that is worth looking at but here's the deal with this like if i was just uh, had my druthers and was just going off in the world i would have watched this and never talked about it ever again like i would have i would have not spent any time exploring this film in any way it's only really because you wanted to do an episode <laughs> Sorry, about it that Chad. i had i mean i don't mean it's but like i like talking about anything obviously <laughs> but this would not have been in my top 10 choices of something weird to resurrect um there's just yeah. so many other things that are just bizarre that i like think i mean or like we're almost spoiled for content now. You know what I mean? Like I could do an entire episode only about Stormfront from the boys. Like that character is so weird so and good. interesting and well, like the boys I think is, it's so interesting because it is a, I, I would argue that it's a hard left storyline. Like it is mm -hmm. very much like it's the first appearance of like bro intersectionality kind of like in a weird way. Like all these guys are from these different sort of like, one guy's a fucking nerd and the other guy is like tragic and fucked up. And the other guy is like this just cool black guy who cares about his family. But get, and then there's a French drug dealer. Like you see that in like ensemble war films kind of. But in this one, it's like no one's really like conventionally heroic except for Butcher. But he's like a terrible person. But the superheroes are just so like what is wrong with them are like the type of shit that like Chomsky or Howard Zinn thinks is wrong with America. But it's so well done, and it's what's so weird about having that take is that it's still funny. Like, it, like what's so great about it is that they figured out that they could advance this like hard left political agenda with dick jokes. Like, and it gives me such hope for the future that like, hey, look, man, we all think like an extending Russian penis choking someone almost to death is fucking hilarious, and it seems like that's like a great part to build on. Yeah. And that kind of read of it is obviously insane. You know, like my whole perspective on it is weird. But there's something to build on. Like, there's nothing to build on with Veronica. You know, it's not saying anything. Like, that's the thing. It's not saying anything. It's just trying to be a, an object of pure aesthetic expression, which is fine, but it's, it's very not noble. good. Yeah, it's, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Do you think this would have been better if it had been more black metal? Well, if by black metal you meant extreme and dark and, well, fucking absolutely. Cause I mean, like, like shot in black and white. Yes, like harsher looking. Another thing that is baffling about this movie is that Glenn Danzig, a musician, did the score and mm -hmm. chose the music. And his music choices are 
pretty banal, and the score is completely unremarkable. But if this movie was shot in grainy black and white, and let's say had really like suicidal depressive black metal, like mm -hmm. really minimalist, smeared, atmospheric, almost ambient black metal, this movie would be like so much fucking better. Mm -hmm. If I had access to the footage and was given like, you know, two weeks to just add black metal, make it grainy and cut off maybe 10 minutes of this film, I think mm -hmm. it would look, be really interesting. Totally. Yeah. Because it would suddenly be actually atmospheric. Yeah. Potentially. I, did, I keep waiting. I don't know. For, has anybody really applied like a black metal aesthetic to a film? I mean, sure, somebody must have. Like there's like the the black metal movies about the bands. Like, but Well, there's A Spell to Ward Off Darkness. Um, that's not a narrative film by any stretch. I really love that movie. It's it's really beautiful. Lords of Chaos is not really a black metal movie. It's about black metal. and It's, it's just, more like a music biopic. It's like yeah. more straightforward. Yeah. Um, it's, it's way before black metal really took hold, but the movie Begotten mm -hmm. has a certain sort of black metal-ness to it, but it's not that great. I don't know. Your band's video turned out fucking great. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I didn't have a hand in actually making that video, but that is an example of mm -hmm. atmosphere that I think is really, thank you. I'm super happy. Hey, everybody. My band has a video out. Go look. My heart and inverted flame dot com. Listeners, if you can think of any movies that have a, a, a genuinely black metal aesthetic. There's probably a ton that we just don't probably, know. I, it's yeah. just not coming to the top of my head. Yeah. Is that it? I mean, like all I can really do at this point is find new ways to articulate my disappointment with this film. Yeah. So what have we learned? I mean, like nothing. Stay in your lane. I mean, don't I try mean, new things. Yeah. Stay in your lane. Don't try any things. Don't branch out. Don't do anything. <laughs> Never push yourself. Rest on that, your laurels. That little voice in the back of your head that says you probably can't do that thing. It's, it's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Don't read the artist's way. It knows you better than anyone. <laughs> <laughs> all right everybody again you can email us at what the at scary org, and thank you all for listening thanks and don't watch this movie I totally lost. I went off the rails there completely. I think we should <laughs> just delete that section. <laughs>